Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Uplift. My name is Kyle. If you're joining us online, we're so glad that you joined us. And if you're listening on our podcast, glad you found us. We're going to start, we're going to jump right in by reading one specific sentence written by the Apostle Paul, written to the believers in the church in the city of Philippi about 30 years after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And it's this from Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. He wrote, I know how to be brought low. I know how to be brought low. That's a crushing sentence. That's just a crushing, crushing sentence in just a few words. In just a few words, we hear from Paul the, both the knowledge and the experience of pain right there. The realization of, of pain and of trauma, it alarms us. It's dysregulating to us. You and I, we expect pain and difficulty, but when it happens, it never is the same as it appeared in our lives before. And every time we are experiencing pain, we have a brand new maze, a brand new labyrinth of how to either remove the pain or recover from it. So in a series called Faith and Mental Health, I thought it important to talk about pain, about being brought low, through four distinct movements. They're on your order of worship. We'll, we'll talk about these in the, in the next few minutes. And it's my hope that talking about pain and a fresh perspective on pain, that we, we can come to some equilibrium in regard to how we view and understand pain in light of the gospel. So let's just begin with the obvious. The very first thing is just Let's just talk about the reality of pain for a minute, the reality of pain, and really referencing Paul's sentence in Philippians chapter 4. I know how to be brought low. Paul's sentence in Philippians chapter 4 verse 12 is not an unusual sentence. It's not unusual. In fact, all of our English translations of this sentence, they're not fancy if you find them on other, on other platforms. They're all about the same, and they're all quite literal but each of these sentences betrays the truth. And this is the truth, that Paul was a recipient. He was a recipient of that which brought him low. In other words, he didn't agree to it. He didn't agree to be hurt. And in other words, the verb in this sentence is in the passive voice. And what that means is that it means that he was being brought low, that it happened to him. He received it. He didn't do it. He didn't do pain. He received pain. It happened to him. He, he knew the kind of pain that he didn't cause. Pain is really the great equalizer in life. It cuts through life with a blade that spares no one. It's, it's the thorn. Let's just be honest. It's the thorn in the side of believers. It's the favorite weapon of atheists. It's a splinter in the divine plan because it's real. It's absolutely real. And the question we often ask, regardless of the severity of our pain, whether physical or mental, is this. How can a benevolent God coexist with pain? That's our question. We've asked it before. You might have even asked it today. We especially ask it in the middle of pain that we feel like cannot be relieved. I want to recommend and show you a book. It's uh, written by C.S. Lewis, and it's called The Problem of Pain. I don't know if you've ever read this book. I read it this weekend. I recommend it. You can read it in, a, in one setting. C.S. Lewis was uh, no stranger to the cruel twists of life, and he wrote a book describing the reality of pain to him. Again, it's not very long, and I highly recommend it that you read it. Now, let's talk about C.S. Lewis for a minute. He really didn't have a charmed life. I mean, he gave us the Chronicles of Narnia, but he was absolutely well acquainted with grief and pain. 
I'll just kind of run down some of the things that happened to him. His mother died when he was a child, left him alone with a very distant father. As a young man, he saw the horrors of war firsthand. Oxford University is intellectual sanctuary. It turned chilly when academic snobbery reared its head. He found love later in life, but it was snatched away with the death of his life. Now, this isn't and wouldn't be considered the resume of a scholar. It's really the life story of someone who was intimately acquainted with pain. And let's just be honest, this story is not unusual. Many of us in here can list our own moments of being brought low. We can do that. I don't want to exalt Lewis's pain over yours, but I am thankful that he wrote about it. I am thankful. So in 1940, he was 42 years old. He wrote The Problem of Pain. What I really appreciate this book is he didn't come at it with the arrogance of certainty, but really with the humility of someone who knew that he might be way out of his depth. But he felt compelled to tackle the issue head on because he understood its seismic implications for faith. I mean, C.S. Lewis was an atheist at one time, and he knew the problem of pain was a powerful argument against the existence of God. So in this book, he tackles the tough question, how can a loving, all-powerful God allow so much pain? And he focuses his entire argument on his definition of the problem of pain. And this is his definition. Pain wouldn't exist if God weren't good and powerful. Let me say that again. Pain wouldn't exist if God weren't good and powerful. That's what makes pain real. Let me read you a quote. This is what he wrote about it. Pain would be no problem, Lewis wrote, unless side by side with our daily experience of this painful world, we had received what we think a good assurance that ultimate reality is righteous and loving. In other words, without a divine standard of good and evil, pain would be neutral. It wouldn't be pain at all. It would just be another thing and another event in life without any emotional attachment. I mean, we can't even comprehend life without hurt, but Lewis's definition of the reality of pain is good, and it's right. But that still doesn't answer the question, right? If God is good and he's omnipotent, why does he let bad things happen? Let me read you another quote. This is Lewis's description of the problem of pain and the reality of it. He wrote, if God were good, he would wish to make his creatures perfectly happy. And if God were almighty, he would be able to do that which he wished. But the creatures are not happy. Therefore, God lacks either goodness or power or both. That's the problem. That's not necessarily what Lewis believed to be the reality of life, but that's why pain is so real and difficult to understand. It's raw and it's truthful. We've, we've shared this sentiment. I mean, maybe not quite as eloquently, but we've experienced pain and we're wondering in the grips of pain why it's even there. Pain's real. And we ultimately invariably return to this question. So to answer it better, we need to look at the second movement of in this fresh perspective on pain, and it's this. It's the voice of pain. What, is pain. what does pain look like? What does it sound like? Well, to look and to listen to the voice of pain, we got to talk about pain as it is reflected in the lives of those who followed God to the very end. And to do that, I want to read from a couple of those guys. One is from the prophet Jeremiah found in the Old Testament. We're going to start in... Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 14, and it bleeds over into chapter 20, and we're going to read through verse 2. They're side by side. It's only four or five verses. And Jeremiah came from Topheth. This is Jeremiah 19, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and he stood in the court of the Lord's house. So he's in Jerusalem now. And he said to all the people, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, 
I am bringing upon this city and upon all its towns all the disaster that I have pronounced against it because they have stiffened their neck, refusing to hear my words. Beginning in chapter 20, now Pashur the priest, the son of Emer, who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Verse 2, then Pashur beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. Now, these four or five verses is the culmination of instructions given to Jeremiah from God. And these instructions were to prophesy against the Jewish people in Jerusalem. In other words, all eyes are on Jeremiah. This is not an easy thing. And he's not saying nice things. He's saying very harsh things. But he did this because he was told to do it. And that's important. Jeremiah did not do any of this on his own. He was told to do all of this. And he was told to do it without being told the consequences or what would happen to him when he preached what he was told to preach. In other words, just go. Just go. So for doing the Lord's work then, for doing the Lord's work, for following the word of the Lord, Jeremiah was publicly beaten in Jerusalem, all eyes on him, and he was placed in stocks where everyone could see him. Publicly beaten, publicly imprisoned. Jeremiah was brought low. He received pain he didn't ask for, nor did he cause. That's important. Let's talk about Paul. This is Paul's assessment of what it was like to be brought low. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You've read this before, beginning in verse 24. This is what he wrote. Five times, I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, in the wilderness, at sea, from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. These are Paul's words. Paul said, I know what it means to be brought low. I understand this. Pain has a voice. It has a voice. You can't really, you can't really describe how pain feels, but you can describe what caused the feeling. You can describe how you got there. You can describe how you were brought low. It's, in fact, it's your testimony. That's what it is. You own it. You know it. Jeremiah knew it. And Paul knew it. Now, let me share something with you. The risk of sharing these profound experiences from those who witnessed firsthand the power and the voice of God is that it possibly establishes, falsely establishes a baseline from which we think we should operate. That's a risk. In other words, we've been taught, or maybe it's better said that I've been taught, very fundamentalist idea that our experiences in life and Christianity and faith should match those in Scripture. That if we believe in Jesus, we should have these less than desirable desirable experiences. And if we don't have them, we aren't true believers. I've been taught that. I'm not telling you that because I don't believe that. I'm not judging, I'm not judging your experience with God because here's the truth. You could write your own short biography of your experiences with God. You could write them out. In fact, I experience, I, I, I uh, I think you should. You can remember and you can retell all of the harrowing parts of your life. You can write them out. You know exactly the moments when God was obvious and you also know the moments where you believed him to be absent. You got them. They're fresh. They're right there. You know the job losses, the traumatic deaths. You know the onset of depression in your life or in the lives of those you love. You've experienced, maybe, multiple panic attacks. You, like Jeremiah and like Paul, 
You're like C.S. Lewis. You bear the scars of tough times. You got your own. Pain is real. It has a voice. You've been brought low. But what is the purpose of all this? Well, what's the purpose of pain? And that's the third one. What's the purpose of this? That's really the question. Why do we hurt? Let's go back to Philippians. Go back to Philippians chapter 4. And I want to read Paul's sentence that we began with, but I want to read it in context. We're going to begin in verse 12. We're going to read through verse 13. This is the end of the letter. And Paul wrote this. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We know these verses. But this passage is alarming because it says things with which we really may often disagree. And it's this, that there is value, there's value in being brought low. Just as there is value in being in abundance. Paul knew and experienced both of those, and he assigned value to both of them. He saw both of those as opportunities to learn. He says this. He viewed every circumstance as education. This is what he wrote. I have learned the secret of facing every circumstance. Now, Paul's a great writer, loved the dramatic flair, and he used a word here that's used only once in the entire Bible. And it's the verb that's translated in our English translations as have learned. The Greek word is muin, or at least the root of it. And that word means to imitate, or I'm sorry, to initiate. Again, it's used here the only time in the entire Bible. It's a loaded word. It's a loaded word. In fact, our, our English translations aren't really sure what it, how to translate it. Translations usually rely on previous uses of the word. So when it's isolated, it's a little different. That's why when you read this verse in multiple translations, it reads a little differently. This word conjures up images, at least to those, the, the recipients of this letter, it conjured up images of the secretive rites of mystery religions in their world, in the Roman Empire. It's a word that other mystery religions used. You can almost picture Paul borrowing a term straight from the playbook of pagans. He knew full well it was going to hit home with his audience, and he used this particular word for one reason. He wasn't born knowing the secret of facing every circumstance. By using this word, he's letting us in on the fact that this was a hard-won lesson. It's one that feels more like a rite of passage than a revelation, like an initiation, right? When Paul says, I've learned the secret, what he's really saying, if we're going to kind of translate this into 2024 English, is that I've been through the ringer. I've seen the highs and I've seen the lows and I've come out on the other side. It's, it's as if Paul wants us to know that the journeys through pain and abundance aren't just strolls and stops in life. They are initiations into the gritty reality of the human condition. Maybe, maybe we could say it better this way, that not that he learned the secret of facing every circumstance, but that he earned the secret of facing every circumstance. So, and what Paul learned or earned at first glance seemed really familiar to the Philippians. The philosophy of their age, by the way, let's do a little bit of history. The philosophy of their age was Stoicism. Now, Stoicism is the discipline and the philosophy of determining what is up to us and what isn't. That's really basic. Stoics believed that the world operates with a web of cause and effect. And the job of humans was to respond with virtue and self-control. Now, don't be tricked into thinking this is honorable because it's not. Stoicism is really just apathy. That's all it is. Don't expect much from the world. Don't love much in the world. Be distant. 
be disassociated. In fact, we got another word for this in 2024. It's not quite the same thing, but it's really close, and it's this. It's nihilism. Nihilism. Nihilism is the idea that nothing really matters. So you can kind of see where it kind of it kind of sidles up to stoicism. Nihilists believe that you can truly do whatever you want because there is no cause and effect. The world operates best when people are completely autonomous and detached and distant. But the singular problem with nihilism and even stoicism is this. It's desire. Nihilism is almost impossible to adopt because we care. We care about things. We're created to care about things. And that desire, that care is what highlights our pain. We care about something, therefore we hurt when expectations aren't met. In fact, it's that care and that desire that gives our pain its purpose. We experience pain because we care, because we know the good to be had. But, but let's be honest, let's be honest. Care can be exhausted. You can run out. It can also be exhausting. It can be exhausting to care, especially when you're in the throes of difficulty. It's hard to care. I mean, the question you've asked is this. I've asked you, why care if things aren't going to get any better? What's the point, right? So let's talk about that. And this is the fourth thing. Let's talk about our response to pain. We're going we're gonna to park here for a little while, so I just kind of want to let you know. The truth of this is that Paul recognized that even he did not have the strength to care. Now, I want you to understand that. Paul's our superhero, right? But even Paul admitted that. Or at least he admitted he didn't have the strength to care for very long. Here's, here's the, the truth of this, because even though we do care, we are really discontent by nature. That's who we are. I mean, go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, right? A, a garden of Eden, a garden of perfection, perfect humans placed in this perfect garden with purpose. They're there. They did not want for anything, and they couldn't be content. They couldn't be content in a perfect garden. That's who we are. We see what we have, and we want more. The story of Adam and Eve proves that. Look at Paul's final phrase in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. You probably quote it. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul knew in this really tough lesson that stoicism or nihilism really is just life without Jesus. That's really what this is. And Paul knew that the wisdom of Jesus, this, this God crucified and resurrected, was his source, was the source of his ability to cope with both pain and pleasure. In fact, previously in Philippians chapter 3, Paul said this. This is in verse 10. Paul wrote that, I, I want to know him. I want to know Jesus, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. And I want to share in his sufferings, and I want to become like him in his death. This to me is one of the most, if not the most amazing things Paul wrote. Because when he wrote this, he was in his 60s. Deformed scarred from beatings and imprisonments. This is the man that we would assume would know Jesus. And in, what does he write? I want to know Jesus. You would assume he knew him. And he's chasing him to the very end. He wants to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. And here's why. He writes this from jail. He's incarcerated when he writes this. But he knew in that moment that Jesus experienced pain and Paul was chasing the very same response that Jesus had to pain. And it's this wisdom, this pursuit, this chase by Paul that is his ability to respond to pain. The, 
The, the writer of the book of Hebrews says it another way. This is from Hebrews chapter 5. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. How many of you have prayed with loud cries and tears? To him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, Jesus became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is not apathy. This is not stoicism. This is not nihilism. This is engagement. This is engagement. This is Jesus relying on a power outside of himself to endure pain. That's what this is. And and in what is maybe the richest narrative of all of Scripture, Jesus had another will for his life. Now, I mean, that's the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. If there is another way, Lord, let me do it. Let this cup pass from me. All right, that's, that's the prayer. But if you want me to, if you want me to endure this pain, Lord, I'm going to do it. I don't want to, but I'm going to do it because it's your will. Jesus had another will for his life that involved less pain, but instead he surrendered that will to God to the divine plan of crucifixion and redemption. And the greatest truth of the gospel is that Jesus knew how to be brought low. That's what he knew. Let's return to Jeremiah. Jeremiah understood this endurance as someone who was brought low. I want want you to look at what he says following his preaching and his subsequent beating and being locked in stocks in the middle of Jerusalem. This is from Jeremiah chapter 20. It's, we're going to begin in verse 7. This is a prayer. Lord, you enticed me, and I was taken in. You were too strong for me, and you prevailed. Now, now I'm laughed at all the time. Everyone mocks me. Every time I open my mouth, I cry out and say, violence and destruction. In other words, this is what you told me to say, Lord. The Lord's word has brought me nothing but insult and injury constantly. And I thought, I'm going to forget him. He's talking about God. I'm going to forget God. I'll no longer speak his name. But look at this. But there is an intense fire in my heart, trapped in my bones. And I'm drained trying to contain it. I'm unable to do it. Now, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. But I want to first focus on one particular part of what Jeremiah said. In fact, we're going to zero in and focus in on one particular word Jeremiah used at the beginning of this prayer. Look again in chapter 20, verse 7. The translation that I read to you said this, Lord, you enticed me. Now, some translations, and maybe your favorite, is going to have a lot of different words here. Some translations say, Lord, you deceived me. Some say, Lord, you persuaded me. Some say, Lord, you coerced me. And there are others that say, Lord, you seduced me. Now, that word has a lot of connotations and meanings. And one that's maybe the strongest actually means physical intimacy between a husband and wife, but forced physical intimacy. The word seduction could easily fit here. And regardless of where translators and scholars land, I'm sharing it with you because this prayer is as fresh as the prayers you probably, I've prayed today, maybe you. Let me give it a more contemporary translation. Let me read to you again first, all of verse 7. Lord, you enticed me, and I was taken in. You were too strong for me, and you prevailed. I'm laughed at all the time, and everyone mocks me. Maybe you hear it, And pray it this way. God, you did this to me, and it hurt. And I let you. This, by the way, is what Jeremiah is saying. You brought you, you brought me low. I say that I let you do this, but honestly, I can't resist what you did because you're stronger than me. This was something you forced. Upon me, and I'm going to be honest in a general confession. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed that kind of prayer. The prayer is, Lord, I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to be here. I didn't ask to be here. I didn't ask to feel this way. 
But could I have even resisted it? Jeremiah, in this prayer, was a man without options. I felt the same, and so have you. And back to C.S. Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain, he underscores these truths. What pain does is it actually orients us back to God. Because God is the only one who can make sense of it. And that's where our response lies. I want to recommend another book to you. You've probably heard about it. It's called Bad Therapy. The subtitle is Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up. It's by Wall Street Journal columnist and best-selling author Abigail Schreier. Now, let me say this. She's a non-believer. She's a professed non-believer, by the way. So this book is not necessarily a book written from a Christian worldview or perspective. What it is, is an investigation into uh, the mental health industry. That's what it is. She gave a recent interview with famous podcaster Joe Rogan, and they began to talk specifically about the mental health issue of depression. And I transcribed her quote. You can find the interview on YouTube if you want or on wherever you find your podcast. But this is what she said in the interview. The number one symptom of depression is rumination. And the rumination is this pathological obsessing over your pain. And one of the reasons, aside from chemical reasons, that doing anything like exercise or running errands is, is good. It's good for your mental health. Getting out of your house and accomplishing anything is good for you. But sitting around and talking and thinking about your problems is a bad habit. And the best cognitive behavioral therapists and the dialectical behavioral therapists and the ones who do really well treating and helping people with depression try to break that bad pattern. Now, before we kind of wrap this up, I want to state the obvious right here. I'm ill-equipped to diagnose or treat mental health issues. That's not really the point. But I draw attention to this quote in, the light, in light of the idea that we receive pain. And that even those who are experts in this field, such as Abigail Schreier, again, a self-professed non-believer, even experts know the problem of pain and the way to cope. But here's the limitations of that. She doesn't have, nor does she prescribe, all of the information. Paul does. Paul does. Let's look at his statement from Philippians chapter 3. Look at what he wrote. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if, if, any, if anything you think, if any one of you thinks otherwise, I think that's probably a problem with me. God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Look, look, look at what Paul wrote, thinking about what Abigail Schreier said, forgetting the past, straining forward, pressing on, holding to that which is true. This is the full truth to which Abigail Schreier partially alluded. Yes, break the habit of rumination, break the habit of obsessing over pain. I get that. But that's only half because you can't. This is where things like this fall short. You can't break that habit with your own strength. If you could, you'd never hurt. Because building upon our own strength for these things is impossible. In the grips of pain, we don't have the strength to do these things. We don't have the strength to forget the past or to strain forward or to press on and to hold on to that which is true. We can't. But by the grace of God, we can. And this is how Paul puts it. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal 
that also to you. The great truth of the gospel and the, maybe the, the best perspective on pain is that God reveals to us the way out of pain. And listen carefully. It might not be immediate. It might not. It might take the coaching and care of professionals to help you. It may take some help. It may take a good counselor. It may take a trusted confidant, but God through Jesus, doesn't desire to leave us in pain. And that's the truth of the gospel. And I believe right here that God will show us the way out of it for his glory, for his glory.